Hello everybody and welcome to this episode of the Conscious Grief series. Today I am joined by Evelyn Moon who is the Director of Education for Good Grief which is a non-profit organization in New Jersey. Welcome Evelyn. Thank you, thank you so much, I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy that you're here as well and it's uh, interesting timing because we are recording this on the 1st of June and this comes just after the recent shootings in the US, which has, you know, rocked everybody to their core again. And your work uh, with Good Grief is, you know, more pertinent and important than ever. So I'm just super excited to have discovered you. You know, it's a very inspiring organization that that exists and I don't think we have anything like this here in the UK um so I was thinking first of all perhaps you could really just introduce the Good Grief organization what you do and how you first came to work for them sure um so Good Grief is a nonprofit organization based here in New Jersey in the United States and we have two physical locations, our, our family and grief and bereavement centers. One's in Morristown, one's in Princeton. That's where I'm currently seated in our in our teen centers. The teens have a very cool space for, for them to relax and connect with each other. And um, so for most of our organization's history, we've been providing completely free and unlimited peer support programming to grieving children and their families. Uh, we joke and say that we start as young as three and we go to 30 with the kids. So from very, very young through young adulthood, we provide completely free and unlimited peer support programming. Typically in the evening, families come to us from September through June every other week, and they connect generally with the same group of people. Everyone's assigned to their week. They keep the same consistent facilitators. Um, and we also have virtual peer support groups, which I would say our young adults are the most likely to take advantage of it. During COVID, it was that was all we were doing during quarantine and during lockdown here, but we've maintained it because our young adults, as they go off to college and move out of the home and things like that, we've been able to keep those connections and keep that support with them. So, um, you know, Zoom has really uh, been a blessing for us and our work and our ability to stay connected to our young people. Um, in recent years, our work has changed. It's been growing mainly through education and through advocacy we want to provide training and curriculum and resources. Um, I primarily work with schools, but we also partner with hospitals and healthcare settings, um, the funeral industry, which is very funny because you would think they would know a lot about <laughs> supporting grief and supporting young people in their grief. But I think like any company that we are partnering with, you know, they are, they are a business um, and they could use the support. But we, we also partner with private companies, other nonprofits, the idea being that we just wanted to take what we do outside of the walls of these centers. You know, we want to empower professionals, parents, really whoever the community is, so that way they can support the needs of children and families who are facing any kind of loss in adversity. Um, I would say this looks a lot like our professional development sessions. We have summer camp experiences. So we have one coming up this August. It's called Grief Expression. So young people come to us for a week-long day camp experience and art, music, drama, um, all through supporting and sort of processing their, their grief. Um, we have online experiences and advocacy. But I do think one of the most important spaces I feel we've branched out to to support is school communities, school staff, students, parents, um, caregivers, really the whole school community. Amazing. I love, sorry, everyone can probably see me coughing furiously. <laughs> um, it will calm down. Uh, I love all of this collaboration that you do and the way that you're, you know, branching outside, like you say, the walls of, of your organization and going into schools and helping educate uh, people within your community um, and further afield, like you say, now you have the use of Zoom. Um, so you feel, it feels very much like your grief educator mm -hmm. to me. And in the schools, for example, 
you know, what are the sorts of things that you're recommending in the schools about how to talk about death and grief? Yeah, I mean, I have to say before I jump in with that, it is a it's a tough time right now to be a parent. It's a tough time to work at a at a grief support org in the United States. There is this this weight, this collective grief that we are all dealing with due to the school shooting in Texas. And I would say um, the first thing, the first advice I guess I would give is that I'm doing my best to extend grace to myself and to those around me. Um, the fact is we're all carrying burdens all the time, but it just feels really present to me right now. Um, and in schools, though, and with parents too that I've been speaking to lately, the ways that I've been suggesting to support really looks like deep listening, you're making that space for conversations. Um, I recommend people to engage with the news on their own terms, you know, make their, their own decision about when and where. There's a lot of navigating of difficult conversations with young people in my life right now, but also with the teachers that I support in, in my work because everyone is sort of not adrift, but it, you know, we're, it's um, unsettling when things like, like this happen. So in schools, we, we have developed training to help the adults feel, I think, first, more confident and more competent just all around with all things that have to do with grief and loss and adversity, because ultimately we're a peer support organization. We work on building up those supportive relationships among peers, but also the caregiving relationships. So whoever that, um, that adult, that grown up is in a child's life, building up their capacity um, to change the conversation around grief, around death, and around adversity in the school space. And I, I just think it's really funny because grief really truly is a universal experience. It, it's something that will happen to every single one of us, but we're really bad, at least here in America. I don't know if it's universal everywhere, but it, we're bad at talking about it and supporting others. And I think honestly, most people, they don't know what to say or what to do. They don't know what to do for themselves while they're grieving because nothing's really, I think, being modeled for us. So what would you say are some of the sort of common um, mistakes, if you like, around language, uh, using different language around death and grieving? I, I mean, I would say that the number one mistake is that adults sometimes will avoid these conversations um, because it's, it's us, it's our stuff, we feel uncomfortable. There's, there's also this myth that talking about death or the events that led up to a death with a child harms them in some way. And something that is really present for me in our centers is much to other people's surprise, the grievers do want to talk about their person who died. So I'd say that is the number one thing is avoiding the conversations, um, but also another problem is not using really clear and concrete language especially with very young children. At our centers, we're intentional about saying dead, death, died, and we say person who died. We don't want to sugarcoat it. We don't want to use euphemisms. Um, and again, we don't want to avoid the conversation. So when people say things like they're in a better place, or they've gone to sleep, or they're in heaven with the angels, that can be really confusing for a child because they take things very literally, especially young ones who they, they just don't have the concept of a soul or an afterlife. So their responses will be like, well, when are they coming back? You know, heaven, where's that? Like, can I go there? Um, can we go wake them up? So we really do try to be as clear as we can. And we were also very intentional to not say loved one with any of our grievers here because we don't want to assume a relationship, even with a child. We have children that come in with all different types of relationships and feelings about their, their person who died. So, you know, everyone, children included, experience the death of people that they, they didn't necessarily have the best relationships with. Um, so we, we never want to impose anything on them. Mm. So as a result of that, our, our, the kids in our program speak about death in very frank, very direct terms, which can be really jarring for adults who might be uncomfortable talking about it. Yeah, it's, it, I can imagine. Yeah, they <laughs> can then start educating the adults, these young children. Yes. 
not feeling like you say the same discomfort as we do or wanting to avoid in the same way that adults do. Yeah, that's all learned. You know, we, we teach them to be uncomfortable with these conversations. We teach them that some things are just not talked about or, or shameful or to be hidden in some way. So um, in a lot of ways, we're either undoing that, that learning in adults or in our young people that come in, or we're just making sure that it never takes root in our, our particular young ones. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have, um, you know, an emphasis on different age groups and, and different creative exercises. And, you know, one of the things that I found really interesting from our initial conversation was the volcano room. So mm -hmm. I'd be great if you could share a little bit more about what the volcano room is and what that looks like. Yeah, it's, it's very fun. And when people see it on the tours of our centers, I think the reply is always, I could use one of, one of these in, in my office. Um, our, our centers are really, they're just bright, beautiful, welcoming spaces. Um, but we know that kids and adults too, you know, people grieve in a lot of different types of ways. Some are more processing through conversations. They wanna talk about their emotions. They wanna talk about their feelings. Others are very physical in their grief and, you know, they, they need to be doing something. They need to be moving. Um, they need to feel like they're, they're doing something as part of their process. But sometimes, whether it's physical or whether it's emotional, sometimes you just have to ah, <laughs> get it out. And that's why we have our volcano room. It is a, a padded room. It's got special coverings over the windows. So nobody <laughs> goes through the window that's in there. And it's full of all different types of you know foam shapes balls there's a punching bag in there uh, and kids could go in there and literally bounce off the walls they're not going to get hurt we don't overcrowd it I think the limit is maybe two that are in there and they're not allowed to start pelting each other with stuff it's just to let that energy out uh, we have a gigantic sand timer so they get two turns of the sad sand timer I think it comes out to about maybe three minutes of just letting it all out as hard as they can before they go back and either rejoin the conversation that they were doing or rejoining the activity for that night. Um, there's also some choice, especially with our, our younger ones. We have a beautiful art space. Um, we have creative play. We've got a medical play area. Many of the children came to us experiencing death from a terminal illness. So they process a lot through the play, a sand table that has all the typical toys that you would see in a sand table, but also tiny coffins and um, things like that. So they can, they can really process, you know, kids, for them, their work is play. That is how they accomplish so much in their life. So we're just giving them the tools to, to do their, their inner work um, with each other. So the, the volcano room, it actually does have a volcano painted on the door it's a, it's a very popular space <laughs> I can imagine I can imagine I was thinking while you were talking you know about people who perhaps have had a spouse or a sibling or somebody in their family recently die and they're concerned about their child mm -hmm. um what are the sort of um what are the sort of behaviors to watch out for, for people um, in children that where they may be sort of asking for help, but not being able to articulate that? I think with, if we're talking about especially young children, it can look a lot like becoming maybe withdrawn. Um, with young kids, their emotional life will manifest in physical ways too. So you will find when you have a child that's coming to you, with the headaches, the stomach aches, um, sleeping problems, um, increased fears and phobias. You know, suddenly they're very afraid of the, the dark or um, the big bad wolf might suddenly make an appearance and you're going, oh my, like what are, what are all of these worries? Um, they might become very attached, especially if it's a parent who died to the other parent and there's a, a lot of worry and things like, like that. So they might not have the language for the emotions that they're feeling. You know, that is part of our job 
as the grownups that are supporting a grieving young person is to help them build that emotional vocabulary, identify the emotion, and then it becomes our role to you know, validate that emotion. We want to communicate with them, but then also validate that you know they are feeling this feeling and that there's a reason for these feelings. But I mean, I hear this a lot in schools, the, the kid that's always in the counselor's office, always in the nurse's office, headaches, stomach aches, and then they find out they've had some kind of in, incredibly adverse or potentially traumatic experience in their life. And it's just manifesting in very physical ways. Mm. I know that's such a great thing to be reminded of that mm. <clears throat> the complaints of sickness, you know, is, you know, grief affects us on a mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, all mm -hmm. the levels, um, reminding parents um, to, to be aware of those things. Um, and I was thinking if uh, people were, you know, because a lot of people who listen to these, um, these talks are in the United States. And mm. if they, for example, if they did live nearby, you know, how does it work? You know, you mentioned at the beginning, you have an intake that begins in September. Did you, and then it, is it a weekly visit or more frequent than that? How does it work? Well, usually what happens is either a family is referred to us many times by a clinician, by a school, or they reach out on their own. Um, there's no insurance involved or anything like that. We are completely funded by generous donors, foundations, grants, and, and things of that nature to do what we do. So they would reach out to one of our two centers. We would schedule an orientation to make sure that what we offer is a good fit. You know, sometimes families will come to us and right away they know this is where they need to be. Others, it might be a little too soon or maybe just not exactly what they're looking for, but we do take families on a rolling basis throughout the year. But our, our program year does begin in September and runs through June. Um, we have multiple nights running every week, but the families will then get placed into a night that runs every other week, pretty much throughout uh, the school year. They come to us, they get pizza, so they, they get dinner. It's one less thing for them to worry about. And then they, they do get separated so the adults go into different groups. There's the spousal loss group, the child loss group, and then the caregiver group, because we have a lot of caregivers who are now raising children who are, are not necessarily their own children. Um, and the, the kids get separated generally by age, but also by their emotional understanding of death and their comprehension of the reality and the permanence of death. But we, you know, we have our youngest which are in that three to five-year-old range, then younger elementary, older elementary, middle school, high school, and then our, our young adults. So that way they're, they're connecting with other kids who are truly their peers for support. Yeah, because I was thinking about my own experience um, when I was nine, and I really kind of felt like I was the only person I knew who had a dead parent mm -hmm. for most of the time I think that I was growing up so there must be some real sense of <clears throat> you know not feeling alone to be around other people who have had similar struggles mm -hmm. which must, it must be a good feeling for some kids. I agree uh, it can be an incredibly isolating feeling for a young person that sense of being the only one whether that's true or not, because we are so hesitant to talk about these things. Sometimes I wonder if young people even know if they are near other grievers, because we're sort of told to keep it inside. But when they're here, that burden is completely off of them. The, the stigma is removed. They're here with other people who maybe are not having the exact same experience. You know, losing a sibling is very different than losing a, a, a parent or a caregiver. Um, but they're all experiencing the death of someone in their life. They are all grieving. And it's a space where we're saying it's okay to talk about it. Yeah, totally. Because I, I remember when I was little, I would sometimes lie to people mm. that I had a dad because it was so uncomfortable for the reaction of the person that I was talking to, mostly like even with adults. And I think, oh, I, I just don't really want to get into this. So I'll just 
pretend for the sake of the conversation. And from what you shared earlier, it sounds like these kids have really had such a lot of education and and sort of normalizing it as much as you can, but just giving them confidence to speak freely about it, which is really wonderful opportunity to have that space. Yeah, some some dive right into it. Others might come for many sessions and just sit and listen. And that's okay too. Um, we never take silence as disengagement in our in our centers. Um, whether it's our school programs or the programs that we're doing here in our, our two buildings, um, we know that they're probably still getting a lot just from hearing their peers talk about it. Um, and then eventually they, they do start to engage. They do start to share with one another because we're giving them the, the prompts. These activities um, are meant to stimulate those, those conversations and give language to their grief and to their emotions in, in age appropriate ways. I really love that, what you shared about, you, you don't, can you say it again? You don't see silence as a... Oh, we, we never take silence as disengagement. Right, yeah, that's beautiful actually, yeah. It, it's the same with the adults, the adults that I work with, um, I'll let them know just if no one's responding, if no one's going in the chat, I don't take that to mean that they are not present, that they're not listening. I know that that talking about grief, talking about death um, can be hard. It can be really difficult. And people also sometimes need, I think, a little additional processing time when we, we get into the, this sort of topic, especially if it's not something that's normally um, part of their culture uh, at, at work or at school. Mm -hmm. And, and what sort of, um, you know, I, I know that some people have this, <clears throat> can, this perception that probably the work that you do is very, very heavy. And um, you also shared with me how there's also lots of joy and laughter in good grief. And yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to just share a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I think there's... Again, another myth where people believe that grief itself is an emotion rather than yeah you know, this this experience that you're having with your whole self. Emotions are part of it. You know, there's this compilation of emotions, and that's not to say that people don't come to our trainings or our centers for support and that they never ever cry. But I think they're feeling this whole range of emotions um, sometimes at the same time, which can be really uh, complex for kids is they understand um, that they can feel really sad, but then also feel joy and happiness. And there's laughter um, in sharing these stories about our, our person who died and connecting with one another um, and throwing themselves intensely into play. Um, you know, there's shrieks of, of laughter with the young ones, but even the, the adults, you know, you find those moments of of joy so I, I do get that sometimes I tell them where I work and oh, I could never do that it just sounds too sad um but I just I don't think they understand how much we see smiles and laughter and joy you know these these walls have held a lot of good emotions a lot of good feelings and a lot of good memories and I love that you use the repetition of the word good because yeah. that is the name of your organization good grief <laughs> <laughs> but, and I was curious actually about that is there any story behind the name that you know of um yes yeah, so a lot of people think it's because of the old um peanuts gang cartoon um with Snoopy and Charlie Brown because he says good grief but um the name good grief came out of um you know, we have this powerfully just persistent belief here that grief is a good and healthy process, that grief serves a purpose and it has a role in our lives in making meaning out of experiences, that it's not just this thing that's happened to you. you know, it's that grief is good and that it helps you figure out what this means moving forward, you know, how you're creating meaning and purpose out of the death of a person. 
in your life. So for us, grief is not something to be feared or avoided. Um, it's an uncomfortable space, but it's a space that we need to step into. So beautifully said, Evelyn. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I always like to ask people, and it might be a bit similar to, in a way to what you said, but just now, but what your interpretation, this is the conscious grief series, you know, what would mm -hmm. be your interpretation of that phrase, conscious grief? Hmm. Yeah, conscious grief. I mean, to me, it's about that awareness. Um, and I think it's that whole self awareness when we think about conscious grief, consciously grieving. I think when I was younger, I was unconsciously grieving, if that, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I became aware of the permanence of death very young um, due to a terminal illness in my family. I was only in first grade and it, it broke open a realization for me um, that this is all finite and not forever, even though as a kid, it might feel that way, if that makes sense. Um, and I got in trouble because some kid was bothering me and I said, what are you laughing at? Don't you know we're all going to die one day? Oh, I got in so much trouble. Um, but I was just, I was just in it. Um, and I, and I didn't know... I didn't know what to do with it. And, and no one, no one wanted to talk to me about it. Um, and it stayed that way because I think even when I got into high school, like many people, I, I began to experience the death of friends and it started then and it's never really stopped. You know, I'm 40, I'm almost 41 now. Um, but there was no one prepared to talk to me or my peers or anyone about it. We were kind of just adrift with no support, no conversation, you know, no one was answering questions. And there certainly wasn't any healthy coping being modeled. So I feel like I tucked a lot of that away, you know, pushed it back to just not think about it. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized I had to actively engage with these experiences. I had to really grieve these people who had died in my life. And I had to think about what that meant to me and the meaning making process for for my life um you know thinking back to being a teen um i had a very close friend who died and the teens were all brought to the funeral service and the adults all went to a bar and got drunk after <laughs> and we all kind of wound up in a garage sitting around with no idea what to do we were just kind of shocked and silent and then we really just didn't talk about it again even though there she was really important in our lives and it would bubble up i think in really unhealthy ways because we weren't talking about it. We weren't consciously dealing with it. And I, I don't want that for any teen, for any child, for any person. Um, I don't think that people should grieve alone. I think it should be part of community. Um, and that's why the work that I do here is really important to me because I want to equip people with the, with the tools and the skills that they need to be a support to another person. Um, so that way it's, it's a conscious choice. You know, stepping into that space with someone is a choice. It's a conscious choice. It's a vulnerable choice to be empathetic and compassionate and listen to someone who is sitting with their pain because your, your pain understands that pain. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. I just talked I a lot. That, no, I, I absolutely am so grateful for everything that you shared uh, just now, Evelyn. Thank you. And it's really you know, good to hear some more of your own personal experience as well. And while you were talking, um, you mentioned how grief can bubble up in, you know, not such healthy ways if we if we repress it. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I just thought before, you know, was there any ways in particular that you've seen repressed grief come out in unhealthy ways? Um, I think it manifests in all types of unhealthy coping. Like I said, the grownups drinking, I, I see it come out in uh, substance abuse. As a teen, I saw it a lot with increased risk-taking, um, you know, some more aggression, defiance, becoming withdrawn, things like that, that I think people could brush off as normal teen stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, each each action, each behavior had a reason behind it. 
um, there were emotions behind it and no one was engaging with it or speaking about it or trying to find ways to support it. So I think it was, it was just manifesting in ways that ultimately were going to do more harm than good. And it's not just with young people, you know, we see adults who, you know, we were talking about those physical ways that it can come out. Um, you know, they've always got a migraine. <laughs> they've always got these stomach problems. Um, you know, they're, they're turning to unhealthy eating habits. They're not sleeping well. Um, you know, this is all like grief. People only ever think of the emotions. And when they think of emotions, they only ever think of sadness. They forget that there's this whole physical aspect to grief. You feel grief in your body. Um, you feel it in your mind. Um, and you feel it spiritually. You know, whatever that means for, for you, there's no avoiding it. It, it manifests in all these, these places and spaces that make you you. And you have to find ways to care for yourself and support yourself. Um, and again, if you're not consciously engaging with it, it's very easy, I think, to slip into some more unhealthy behaviors, you know, at any age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite, quite right, quite right. And as you were speaking, I was thinking on your website, you have some um, information about supporting yourself and taking care of yourself, haven't you? We do. Yeah, we have um, several tip sheets. I mean, a lot of them are about talking to children about grief, talking about death, you know, supporting grievers. But then we also have you know, ways to care for yourself while you're caring for others. We deal a lot with people in what we call helper roles. So we're looking at teachers, counselors, therapists, parents, but even just the volunteers who are here, they come from all different backgrounds, but they're here because they have heart, because they want to help. Um, and we have to be really intentional and make sure that we're not burning them out, that they're not burning themselves out. Because just like I was saying, you know, you feel grief in all those different parts of yourself. Those also need care. You know, they, they, whatever, even if it's just small things, you know, I can't preach self-care. Um, like I wish there was a one size fits all, like you do these things and then you'll be cared for, uh, because it really does look different for everyone, but you know, we tried to create a tip sheet and it's got 50 different ideas for ways to care for yourself while caring for someone else, um, specifically through that grief and trauma informed lens that we, we do most of our work. Amazing, perhaps we can um, put some a link to those underneath this interview because I oh. think people would really, really benefit and enjoy seeing those um, resources. Absolutely. And is there anything else that you would like to share before we close today? Oh, gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, Evelyn, but I always like to give people the opportunity if there's anything else on your heart that you want to, to mention. Um, I think if I could say one other thing is just to tell anyone who's watching anyone who's listening, um, that they should know that they already have everything that they need to support another person who is in pain, who might be grieving, because it's your, it's your presence. That's all that's really needed. You know, your ability to be compassionate and empathetic is really what's needed. And it's not easy. Um, it's vulnerable, but to listen without judgment, to listen without attempting to fix things for the other person. Um, we all have the ability to sit with someone who, who is in pain, who is in grieving. Um, and yeah, just want to remind them, you know, you all already have what you need. Um, I think it was Mr. Rogers who said that the greatest gift you could give someone is yourself. Um, and you have everything you need to allow another person to feel seen and to feel heard. Thank you so much for that, Evelyn. What beautiful, wise words. Um, you have been such a pleasure to meet and to speak with, and I'm so grateful to know you and to be spreading the wonderful work of good grief. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And thank you to everybody who's been watching and listening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>